Hi, this is Mike Edelhart, and I'm here with another edition of Inception, our podcast, now videocast, about beginnings, beginnings of uh, companies, new ideas in science, sometimes even a little glimpse of the future. And uh, today we'll be talking not so much about the uh, beginning, but a little bit of the uh, past the beginning with Tigran Sloyan of Code Signal. Uh, uh, great to see you. Congratulations on the Series C. And uh, uh, when we first met, uh, it wasn't Code Signal. There wasn't a Series C. It was a long time ago in a kingdom far, far away. So uh, uh, it'll be great to talk about that journey today. Likewise, so great to see you, Mike. It's It has been quite a while. I mean, 2015, February 2015 or yeah. January is when we first met and it, it's only six years but so much has happened and I don't know if I ever told you this story but I, I do you think you're like the third or the fourth investor that I've ever pitched <laughs> in my life I've, I've done a lot of investor pitches since then but that that pitch at Creamery in San Francisco yeah. was one of, exactly. one of the first ones so I was extremely nervous and I was so excited when you were like yeah this this is amazing you know we, we, we want that <laughs> we thought it was a great idea and we were uh, impressed with you right from the very uh, beginning uh, and we should probably share with folks what that idea was. It was the notion of code fights. Mm -hmm. that yeah. I'm a, an engineer and I challenge you to a code fight. Yeah. And, uh, and we felt that engineers would get it, they would do it. And that because of that concept that actually wind up sharing a lot about one another that would be helpful to companies. And and that's what started all this. Yeah, yeah. So interestingly enough, the original idea, it feels very different from what we do today, but it's actually not that different because the fundamental concept behind it was how do we uncover great talent uh, without relying on traditional methods, without relying on resumes, without relying on traditional interviews? How do you go about mapping that you know, talent? Uh, because we know it's there. Everybody understands it's there. Education has been democratized so much in the last 20 years that we know that change has been happening, but it's incredibly difficult to identify that talent. So the initial idea was what if we built kind of a game that will be engaging to those developers and it would attract millions and millions who would challenge each other, who would have fun. And as part of that game, the engine that powered that game would be this assessment engine that figures out who is the best one. Uh, and as we figure out who's really, really good, we connect them to companies and prompt job opportunities for them. Uh, so interestingly enough, that the, the idea in the beginning, it I mean, we did after that 2015 conversation, we raised the 2.5 million seed. Then we did a $10 million Series A a little over a year ago. So there was some merit that was working. There was a lot of traction. But eventually we realized that uh, that is not the right model. We're like trying to go back door, right? Because like we're literally going like so many different ways to end up at that same place. And the idea became like, what if we just build assessment software? Like forget the gamification, forget the competition, forget all of it. Don't go direct to consumers because one fundamental realization for me was that no matter how much you gamify coding and assessments, People would still rather play like, I don't know, Fortnite or Candy Crush than code fights, right? It's, it's just, there's still fundamental things about it that don't make it so much fun that people literally get addicted to it. Uh, so that model like is difficult to scale and difficult to make sticky, right? Because on the one hand, you're like trying to be a consumer brand, but you're not really a consumer brand. You're like a B2B service. So it was literally just trying to do this versus just right. reaching your ear directly, right? Yeah. Uh, so the idea evolved into, well, we are great at building very, very solid assessments, assessments that feel like a flight simulation, assessments that directly measure ability. What if we just package that as B2B SaaS software and deliver it as a solution to our customers? They already get a lot of candidates that they just don't know how to evaluate, right? Like 95, 96% of resumes just get thrown away because you're like, I don't see anything on your resume that tells me you're qualified. And as you well know, that idea, that approach, that pivot of that same mission 
took off like crazy because in the last three years we've done a B and a C and the company has been tripling in revenue every year. So it's been, right. it's been fun. It's, it's been a joy to watch from an investor point of view. And honestly, when you made that pivot, we thought it was a very positive sign and in some ways a great relief because our only concern when we first met you and first invested was, is there an issue of uh, not being entirely authentic, especially with engineers who don't like, uh, who, who like being dealt with plainly and don't like being sold to and don't like being, uh, 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 you know, treated with anything uh, other than sort of respect and, and that sort of thing that, wait, you're doing stuff with what, you know, I'm playing in the background, I don't like it. And so uh, uh, when uh, you went to, to this new model, we felt like, well, that's actually going to be a lot better because everybody knows what's going on. And it's uh, just as effective, maybe proven more effective, but much more straightforward and, and kind of honest up front. Yeah. And I never asked you this. I'm curious, like, what do you look for? Right. Like, because I remember it like back in 2015 and I still had a full time job. I was like running mm -hmm. around, you know, I had no idea how to build companies or anything. I had this cute idea that had generated some traction already. But uh, curious what goes on through your head, right? Like when yeah. you first met me, what were you thinking? How were you evaluating? <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell is this guy? Wait. Exactly, right? I mean, I can imagine being an investor. It must feel like that a lot. So uh, we, we try very hard to uh, create as much order out of chaos as we can. Uh, and thanks for asking. So in our case, every fund is different and every fund has a different methodology. But in our case, we get together every year. We're very data driven in that sense. I think we're more like programmers than most funds are and look at lots of different signals, economic signals, technological signals, uh, human behavior signals to get a sense of here are areas where human need behavior attitude is shifting and science and tech are shifting and where we see them shifting in simpatico ways uh, will get very interested. And we met you right at the time when uh, we felt that uh, uh, work platforms changes. We had another company that uh, called Greenhouse that had done very well on sort of recruiting in other areas and uh, uh, began looking at the whole uh, landscape there. And so we were actively looking for creative, non-standard approaches to getting human beings with certain kinds of skills together with companies uh, that had uh, certain needs. We had a whole sort of point of view. And so when we met you, the first thing was, there's a company that uh, reflects the point of view. We just went to a lot of effort to create. And then the second thing is we're looking at uh, uh, the technology. Is it strong? Is it creative? And you've got an amazing background. And uh, 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 and we felt, and we had every coder we could get our hands on, try it. And, uh, and we felt this is really good. I mean, really good. And we could see how it could do it. And then the third thing is people. Uh, um, do we think you and your team um, really are the best we could imagine taking on this challenge? Because we know there will always be other teams who are worldwide. So is there somebody in back home in Armenia? Is there somebody in Israel and China who may do a better job on this? And, and, uh, and is the right kind of personality to go through what happened, which is everything you tell us in that first meeting is probably gonna turn out not to be true. And we're right. looking and at when it, yeah. <laughs> and when it turns out not to be true, how are you gonna handle it? So we look right. for that a lot. So in a market we care about with really strong tech or science and we're in front of a human being that we feel is up for the challenges uh, ahead, whether they fully understand what they are uh, at this yeah. point or not. And I think here that's been the case and uh, it's all worked really well so far. Yeah. Uh, so, so here you are. So it's been you know, four years and, you know, it's been one of those sort of dramatic rises. There's this curve that we see that is the curve most likely to lead to companies of very high value. It's a curve that unicorns are on and you guys look like you're on it. Doesn't mean you'll be a unicorn, but it sure means you got a shot at being a unicorn. So what do you do from here? What next? So you've sort of gotten through the early rounds. 
you've scored yeah. some points. Uh, yeah. Now what? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, from a valuation standpoint, we're actually nearing the unicorn status. There's probably yeah. less than 12 months away. If we wanted to raise another funding, we could easily right. be there. From a company building perspective, though, because you know how, I mean, I shouldn't be the one telling you the investment market has gone nuts. So yes. valuations are <laughs> whatever you want them to be these days. Right. But it's, I look that at it. Won't, that won't last forever. We're in a uh, moment of sort of a uh, uh, huge release uh, because of being pent up so much money and stuff being pent up during COVID. And after that initial release, there will be a Sunday morning that follows the Saturday afternoon, there will be a 1930s that follows the 1920s um, here. So yes, but we're in a moment of rather unbridled exuberance among exactly. Investors. Yeah, well, the the next morning always comes, they say. So I'm sure that the same thing will happen here, which means I always think about it from my first principles of building a responsible company, a company that follows all of the key elements that great companies have, right? Like, and there's a lot of research. I mean, it's surprising how few people read the research, right? From, you know, Jim, uh, Jim Collins says good to great. I think, well, like, what do they say? It's say first who then what, right? Like for me, right. right now, it's all about first who then what, because uh, we have a solid business, it's growing, it's maturing, but we're gonna go through so many more ups and downs between now and going and becoming a public company. So my main priority ever since the Series B, which was a year ago, and then leading up to the Series C has been, how do I scale the culture? How do I bring continue bringing people in at a much, much faster pace? Because we tripled the company in the last 12 months, and we're gonna triple the company again in the next 12 months. And that's a lot of new people. Like, How do you maintain the quality of the hire? How do you maintain the culture? How do you maintain uh, for example, one key element of our culture is transparency and the, the, the freedom and responsibility over command and control, right? Like we do not, I remember working at companies, well-known companies where I felt like a cog in a giant machine right. was being told to do. And I resented that. I wanted ownership. I wanted to understand what this company is all about. I wanted to make an impact. I wanted to make decisions that mattered versus like, here is a task list, go do it. And I'm really driven to build a company that doesn't become that, right? That right. stays in many ways and empowers the team, empowers the smart, motivated, creative people to make decisions and feel the impact of those decisions. Yeah. But it becomes an order of magnitude more difficult as you get bigger. Because even if you have the best intentions, like one thing that I've been realizing more and more is you can give very, very high transparency, like dump the raw data, everything. And we do, right? Like everything from board meetings to executive team meetings to everything is just shared with the rest of the company. But it doesn't mean everybody consumes that data, right? right? It's not sharing is one thing, making it consumable, making it interesting, right. making it enjoyable in some way so people would do it is a whole other set of questions. Right. Yeah. And if you don't solve for that, you actually start falling back on like, okay, our team doesn't have context. If they don't have context, you got to go back to command and control because without command and control, people make terrible decisions. Everything right. falls apart, right? So <laughs> it's very interesting how yeah. you can take that one thing and so much ripple through the company of what that culture becomes. Right. And then of course, still hiring the right people who will thrive in that culture versus hiring just anybody and saying like, why don't these people perform in right. the culture we're trying to build here? Right, exactly. And 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 from our point of view, you know, we talk a lot because we invest early that a small group of humans that loves what they're doing and loves one another can accomplish essentially anything. Right. And we look for that a lot. We felt you would build that kind of culture. You are that kind of person. But as you say, as you get bigger, you can't be there and it's not small anymore. And uh, it becomes a challenge. And I, I think, uh, at least in my experience with our portfolios earlier in my career, it does come down to who you hire. It's not only hiring folks who fit in the culture, it's hiring folks who are the culture and who by being who they are, not because they're trained, not because they're motivated by crafty uh, comp plans, but because of who they are, radiate the culture that you want radiated. That, that, and it may shift, it may not be exactly the same. It can't be exactly the same. Yeah. But then yeah. if you get that right, uh, 
you know, it's why churches evangelize in that mm -hmm. sense. And you're in, inside the company evangelizing an approach, a culture and, and helping folks in that way. Because, you know, if you got a thousand folks, they're all looking at the same data, even if they all look at it, they're not going to read it the same way. They're not going to parse it the same way. And you're going to get a thousand variations if there aren't folks there saying, you see, you see what's most important. Do we right. all agree? Right. Yeah. And I always say it's a matching problem, right? That like a lot of companies think of hiring as a one directional thing, but it's a matching problem. Right. Certain companies and certain people are a match and others are not. It's not in any way one directional where you just go look for a skill set and then you hire it or right. a personality and then you hire it. It definitely goes two ways. And I've seen in many cases, great individuals who strive in one company and struggle in another. I mean, I am an example of that. I, right. I, I worked at Google. I worked at Oracle. I'll be honest with you. I did not like it. And I was not a top performing employee because I felt like I have zero decision-making power. I have very limited ability to actually make impact and I'm driven by making impact. Right. right. So like you, you literally had me sitting there and being like, I just, feel like I'm not empowered to make any impact or any change here. Right. And I did not stay long, clearly. Right. And then I moved to a startup. And then all of a sudden I was like, yes, you know, I can, I can accomplish anything here. And I was working day and night to do so. Right. It's interesting. You know, I knew you'd worked at Google and we talked about your working at Google, but it's hard for me to imagine you working at Google <laughs> because from the very first minute I met you, it was like, this is a guy, you just drop him down in the middle of nowhere, dune or something. There's sand as far as he can see, and there's nothing. And you come back a year later and there's civilization. He's just <laughs> that kind of person. And so I just can't imagine you in a cubby. I mean, I think your head would explode. It probably did explode. It, it did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I started at Oracle and it was literally like a cubicle and my head was exploding, but I had like a, if I left before 18 months, I had to pay back some sort of sign on bonus. So I stayed 18 <laughs> months to the day. And then I left to go to Google because I was assuming it was an Oracle problem. But then at Google, I very quickly realized that it was a, you know, it was a big company problem in many ways, not necessarily an Oracle yeah. problem. So I, again, did not did not stay long because as you said, right? I, but there are so many people like that and in many of them are the, the most creative, the most resourceful people. And I do believe that a lot of humans are motivated by the freedom and responsibility and they take inspiration from it. Right. Uh, and I do think there are big companies. I mean, Netflix, to name you. Like initially, I thought it was a big company problem, but I do realize it's culture, and it is possible to build a culture that's all about freedom and responsibility in a big company as well. And I do believe Netflix is one of the rare companies that has accomplished it, even though they are gigantic now. Uh, highly recommend uh, Reed's recent book. It's called No Rules Rules, mm -hmm. and the title tells you a lot too, right? <laughs> Uh, and they describe it. There's a lot of myths and misunderstandings about Netflix's culture, but I do believe they have in many ways reinvented, not just, you know, streaming of content, but how should a company be built to be agile, to motivate people who are very self-motivated and are right. driven by impact? It's interesting. Yeah. And I haven't read the book. And so this may be contrary to what he says, but one of the things we talk a lot about at Fund because we've gotten bigger too. We're about three times as big as we were a couple of years ago and worldwide and all that, is uh, that we have to see a lot of companies so that we're confident we've been aware of all available opportunities. But that means that in most cases, uh, we're not going to invest. In almost every case, we're not going to invest. Um, and as a culture, it means that we have to fully celebrate failure. It, we didn't do it. That's great. Um, and not just, yay, you found the company, went all the way through, invested in T-Ground, then he did great. Uh, everything we do matters. And everything we don't do matters. And we have to be as up for and supportive of the not do as the do, because it defines our edges and it defines what matters to us most. And it defines what the group cares about. And, uh, and it's tough because it's human nature to bring out a cake if you win and then to say, if you didn't win, you must lose. And you know this year's Giants team, there was a lot of that where they were celebrating, you didn't swing, it was the wrong pitch. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, he, he yeah. got he made an out, but it was the right kind of out, yeah. and they won all those games, and that I think was a big reason why. I I say a lot of that in hiring, by the way. It's one of our cultural uh, elements to celebrate, you know, how many interviews we did and didn't hire anybody, uh, and not because we're trying not to hire people. It's right. just because you've got to actively fight the bias of trying to feel productive yeah. because one of those th- like, just like with investing, with hiring, it's like, you've spent a lot of time with certain candidate. So everybody literally goes into that last stage interview with a bias of like, I would you, let's just say yes. Right. right? And then yeah. you see a lot where everybody is like, look warm, not really interested in a candidate, even if there's like red flags, right. but nobody wants to really come out and say strong now. Right. to the candidate because they're like, oh, it feels so counterproductive. It's recruiter's performance and everything. It just and feels I'm good. countering your judgment and I love you, man. And I don't want to yeah. say to everybody, I exactly. think maybe you got this one wrong. So maybe I'll just go along yeah. with it. And, and uh, yeah, and the strong culture, we talk about a lot. You have to be able to say, I love you, man, but you're wrong in this yeah. one. Your <laughs> argument, not so good. You're great, but this this particular judgment, I'm not so sure about. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk really quickly before we run. So about this race. So you raised a really healthy beat like a year ago and you've been doing really well. And so you didn't really need money to run the company or anything like that. Now you just raised a really dramatically strong C very quickly. Um, and I saw some articles and things where you were saying, basically you did it because there was a particular investor you really wanted to work with. And uh, so I want to talk about that a little. So it's, you know, index and Nina and, why them? Why her? Why now? What made you say, you know, I just got to do it now. I don't need the money. I could probably get a higher value if I wait, but I'm going to do it now. Why? Yeah, and why, with, yeah. why, why with her? Right. Uh, so, you know how I said, like, you know, you, you were probably like the third or fourth investor that I had ever pitched. Like Nina is probably the second. <laughs> ah. Nina invested in Code Signal through her small fund that she started, like, six, seven years ago, similar. And we were one of her first investments through that the company is called Hive. So I've literally known her for six years. And you know, you always have scenarios where you wish you could like go hire someone, but you cannot because they did you something else. Nina has always been that for me where I was like, I wish we could be on the same team together one day. And I knew one day it would happen and it would present the opportunity. Uh, and when we caught up and felt like, you know, now now is the time and we can make it happen, even though, as you said, we had barely touched our Series B money, uh, we really knew that if we worked together. And I do believe she represents that kind of the, the future of venture capital in a way that uh, very driven by, you know, hands on help of companies of like being more of an operator, right? Like someone you could hire to be like a VP with you in the trenches and making impact. And I've approached our series to be the same. Uh, JP from Menlo has a very similar attitude of like, what needs to be done, right? <laughs> what needs to be done? How can we go get in there and do it? And as a founder, as an entrepreneur, that's what you want. You don't, I mean, sure, you want the board uh, investors to also hold you accountable because that accountability helps. But I'm my worst critic, right? Like I hold okay. myself to a standard that like it's hard to hold a higher standard to that. So I want investors who are capable and ready to get in there and make stuff happen with me because uh, you want the more capable, smart, connected people in your corner, the higher the chances of company success. Right. Does it come with dilution? Yes, it does. Is Am I optimizing for trying to get a little bit more out of my equity in the company? Not really. I'm in this to build a world-changing company that's going to ripple through history and more great people in your corner, the higher the chances of that happening. That's great. That's probably as good a place to end it as any, though. Uh, I think we'll probably keep going for hours, but uh, uh, we've got to keep on our respective schedules. Congratulations again. Great to see you. Let's do it again next year and Please. see if if, uh, if you've done another uh, you know, a gigantic round or, or what's happened next. It's been you great it. to be part of it and i uh, love to keep chronicling the story here. Love it. I, sh- I think we should keep doing this until we IPO and then we can do another episode. That sounds good. New York Stock me. Exchange, okay? That's a, that's <laughs> a, I'm, I'm hopefully going next month for another uh, uh, portfolio company. I've never been up there on the balcony. I, I couldn't get too much of that. I think I'll do it over <laughs> and over awesome. and over again. 
Love yeah, it. maybe next year we can do this uh, actually sitting in the same room. Wouldn't that be great? Hopefully. Hopefully. All right. Thanks so Thanks. much, Mike. Talk Good soon. Good to see you. Bye. Bye-bye.